Uh, we have two long papers today. Uh, the first paper uh, is entitled uh, Resolving Over-Constrained Temporal Problems with Uncertain Durations. That talk will be given by Pandy Yu. Yep. Hi, thanks for coming to the talk. So in the next 20 minutes, I will talk about how to resolve uh, uncontrollable temporal problems. So this is joint work with uh, Cheng Fan and my supervisor, uh, Brian Williams. So the objective of this work is actually very simple, can be summarized in one sentence. So we would like to work with the user to resolve uncontrollable problems and through making trade-offs between first <coughs> risk taken and temporal requirements. So let me start with the example that really demonstrates the expected behavior of our system. Assuming that it's 6 p.m. right now and I'm trying to head home from my lab, I want to arrive home in 40 minutes for the dinner, and I'm a poor grad student so I can only take buses. So I take off uh, my phone and search on Google Map. Google Map gave me two alternatives. So I can either take bus number three, which leaves in eight minutes, and the time required to walk over to the bus stop is eight minutes, or I can take bus 934, which takes slightly longer, but the bus leaves later. It leaves at um, 611, and it only takes me 10 minutes to walk over to the bus stop. As you can see, there are uncertainties in the bus arrival time, which happens all the time. And in fact, this problem is um, oversubscribed because if I take the first option, I'm risking not catching the bus. If I'm taking the second option, I will definitely be late for dinner. So what our system would do is basically, given such an uh, over-constrained uh, over problem, it will help us generate suggestions to make trade-off between decisions make, made uh, constraints that need to be relaxed or risks which should be taken, which equivalent here is the tightening of uncontrollable durations. So first, we can either uh, get, uh, get a suggestion saying that, okay, you can take a uh, bus 934, you can definitely make it, but the consequence is that you will be three minutes late. Or if you want to take the chance, you can actually switch to bus number three. If you get it, you will arrive home on time. But here, as you can see, I'm basically tightening the uncertain duration from 6 to 10 to 8 to 10, meaning that I'm taking a 50% uh, 50 of chance uh, not taking the bus, meaning that my, the whole trip plan will be uh, violated. So uh, in the next, probably night, in my presentation, I, there are uh, four parts. In the beginning, I will define uh, our problem, and then I will present how it's related to our work published in Inchkai last year and what's new here to extend the consistent-based relaxation framework to handle controllability problems. So first, problem formulation. What do we do, what do we don't do? So the problem formulation we use here is called controllable conditional temporal problem. Basically, it means that constraints in the temporal network are conditioned on assignments to decisions. Here, I add controllable to distinguish between uh, conditional temporal problems because all the uh, decision variables here are controllable. We can choose which bus to take. We can choose which restaurant to go to or store for grocery shopping. And here, there are three key elements. First, uh, choices. And second, constraints that may need to, uh, controllable constraints that can be relaxed, and also uncertain durations. Some of them can be tightened if necessary. And the solution is a three tuple. First, we need to figure out what decision we need to make. And second, whether we need to relax some, basically a subset of the constraints. And finally, whether we need to tighten a subset of the uncertain durations in order to make the original problem, which is uncontrollable, controllable. Here, we discuss both strong controllability and dynamic controllability. So another key element here is user preference. Because as you may imagine, for continuous relaxation problem, this, there are usually an unlimited set of solutions you can find for the user. So user preference becomes really important here because we only want to communicate most preferred suggestion to the user. So here, the uh, utility function is separated into two parts. The first part is a positive reward associated with choices made to uh, discrete decision variables. And the second part is the positive cost function that associates either the relaxation or tightening to a positive cost, as you can see in the next graph. And the t overall utility of a solution is basically the difference between the reward and the cost. So still very simple, we simply add uh, preference functions over uh, constraint tightening here. 
So next, let me give you a quick review on our previous work on consistent-based continuous relaxation. So this is published in our uh, paper last year. So what is continuous relaxation? We define this in contrast to discrete relaxations. Basically, assume that we have a temporal problem like this, really simple with only three constraints. We want to have lunch, we want to drive home afterwards, but we also want to arrive home within 60 minutes. This is probably the simplest over constraint problem you can find. Basically, if we take a discrete relaxation approach, it means that we either drop this activity, drop this activity, or completely ignore our constraints, which for all of them, they are not really preferred. The good solution you will get from a real human being is basically you can slightly like relax your arrival home constraint by five minutes and shorten your lunch slightly by five minutes so that you can restore the consistency of the network. Basically, continuous relaxation help us restore the feasibility of problem and minimize the perturbation to the requirements in the original problem. Next, how can we use uh, continuous relaxation to resolve conflicts? Because this is a key a problem is feasible because there are conflicts. So this is separated into three steps. First, we first need to learn conflicts. And in conflicts, usually a set of discrete constraints like this. There are three constraints of conflicts, and they're supported by two different uh, assignments. Go to store B and have lunch and Y. And second step is we want to weaken that set of temporal constraint to a continuous conflict representation by figuring out what the minimum deviation that's required to resolve this conflict. And you can see there's a number negative 30. That is, in fact, uh, actually the number we can learn from negative cycle detection algorithm that indicates, okay, there's a conflict, therefore the problem is feasible. So we simply uh, kind of put all the constraints uh, which are in the conflicts, make them into one equation and equal to the negative value of the loop. And the last step is to basically map that equality into a linear inequality that actually give us guidance to, res to the resolution of this continuous conflict, which means that from that set of uh, constraints, we pick out uh, all uh, three constraints that are relaxable. Relaxable meaning that we can either lower the lower bound or increase the upper bound in order to restore the consistency. And here, the deltas have to sum up to at least the negation of the negative value if the amount of uh, relaxation we applied sum up to a number larger or equal to 30, we know that this conflict will never appear in the problem again. So the whole uh, concept of continuous, continuous relaxation nicely fits into the conflict-directed relaxation framework. Basically, previously this conflict-directed star uh, algorithm was developed for enumerating discrete assignments, but by adding continuous conflict, we can actually enumerate both discrete and continuous assignments at the same time, and, find, um, and the output will be a best first enumeration of continuous relaxations for the user. So this is what we did uh, uh, in the in previous approach for consistent based relaxation. And in order to extend that to handle controllability problem, there are two things we need to do. First, we need to figure out how can we extract conflicts from an uncontrollable problem, and second, how are we going to resolve uh, uncontrollable uh, conflicts? So those, those are the key things I'm going to focus in the next, uh, in the second part of my talk. So first of all, why is it hard? Learning conflicts from controllable tracking algorithm is hard because we kind of lose the one-to-one -one mapping between the edges in the negative loop and the constraints in the original problem. So as we know that either checking strong controllability or checking dynamic controllability, we need to do a series of reductions in order to map the STNU to an STN. But during the reduction, we actually add a lot of new distance edges which are not su directly supported by any constraints in the original problem. So the key concept to address this problem is actually quite simple. Okay, during the reduction, we simply remember what constraints that actually contribute to the newly added constraint. So let me demonstrate that through a very simple example. This applies for strong controllability. Assuming that we have small network with one uncontrollable duration A and two controllable duration B and C. 
In order to check controllability, strong controllability, the first thing we would like to do is to map this uh, to uh, equivalent distance graph. And as you can see, in the di uh, distance graph, each of the distance age is uh, marked with the constraint that where uh, this age comes from. For example, um, this 10 comes from the upper bound of uncontrolled duration A, and this 94 comes from the lower bound of controllable duration B. So what we can do here is basically do one step of uh, reduction because this distance age negative two starts from a contingent node. So we do the reduction using uh, this age negative two as well as the age negative four supported by the lower bound of A and we get this graph which is the third step. And as you can see now the newly added or the reduced age is support has a weight of three and is supported by two constraints, lower bound of A and lower bound of C. And they are marked in red because this is a negative cycle. So how are we going to resolve this negative cycle? It's actually quite simple. We know that we have negative cycle with a value of negative one. We also know that actually there are three constraints, uh, lower bound of A, B, and C. They all participate in, uh, in this negative loop. So the, what we do is basically we generate a linear inequality like what we did in the consistency case. And we know that if the relaxation or tightening we applied to those durations or constraints is larger or equal to one, we can get rid of this negative cycle, which means we can resolve this conflict. So there are like one minor thing we need to pay attention to because uh, delta BL, delta CL, there are relaxation for B and C, so they are okay. But for the delta AL, it's actually tightening of A, meaning that we have to push lower bound of A higher. And as we can see from the original graph, the uh, overall duration uh, of A is between five and 10, meaning that we can at most push the lower bound of A by five. We cannot push it uh, higher than its original upper bound. So this is how we learn conflicts and resolve conflicts for strong controllability. Uh, the same principle applies to dynamic controllability uh, conflicts. It's just a little bit more complex. Here we build the conflict learning uh, uh, procedures on Morris paper in 2006. So from a uh, distance A of, so the first step uh, we took to check controllability is basically decouple the controllable part from the uncontrollable duration. And from there, we generate the equivalent distance graph with conditional ages. As you can see, the initialization of the mapping between constraint and descent ages are a little more complex, but still, once we get over this stage, entering the reduction is actually the same uh, principle we apply for strong controllability. There are five different reduction rules we can use for checking dynamic controllability, and within each of them, we simply take uh, the union of the supporting constraints from both ages, combine them, and attach them to the uh, newly generated reduced age. And there's just one thing to know that uh, constraint may be recorded multiple times during the reduction, meaning that within that new set, you may have duplicated constraints recorded. So um, that's how we learn conflicts. And finally, the last step is actually to resolve a conflict it's interesting that we, in addition to basically compensate for the negative value from a cycle, there's one additional way to resolve a dynamic controllability conflict. And I'm going to show you here because it kind of, the idea comes from the definition uh, from the O6 paper. In addition to compensate the negative value, we can also disable reductions that result in ages in the negative loop. So let me show you an example, example demonstrate this. Let's look at this um, temple network. We have a controllable, dura uh, controllable constraint A, and we have an uncontrollable duration B. So if we do the reduction, and then run, uh, we do the mapping to distance graph and run the reduction algorithm, we will end up with a graph like this, and clearly there is a negative cycle, and the value is quite large. The negative value is negative, uh, negative 990. But the interesting thing is that in addition to like either lowering the upper bound of B or modifying the lower bound, upper bound of A, we can simply just change the lower bound of A from one to zero to resolve this 
conflict associated with uh, this dynamic controllability problem. The concept is basically, if this is not negative one, it's zero, then this path is not negative anymore. If this path is not negative, we won't be able to work, uh, make this reduction, and if this reduction doesn't work, this negative cycle won't exist anymore. So which is interesting, uh, and it's kind of, uh, but the same uh, conflict rate approach still fits into what we did, what I demonstrated in the beginning, because firstly, we have a set of discrete relaxations plus one continuous relaxation while we are expanding our search tree. But right now, it's like we have multiple discrete relaxation plus one or more continuous relaxations, but the whole vast first enumeration uh, framework still applies. So that's all the technical part. In the end of my presentation, I want to show you some interesting experimental results. So we do the same. Uh, we use the same set of test cases from our last year's paper, generated from a simulated car sharing network in Boston. And the uncertainty mainly come from the driving time from location A to location B, which is usually highly uncertain in Boston. So the first thing I want to show you kind of demonstrates the motivation for us to do this controllability-based relaxation. Because the problem we notice with our prior work is that the relaxation we generated is not robust to the actual outcomes while we start executing the plan. It's quite simple because for consistency-based approach, we want to barely restore consistency, meaning that most of the time, we are only conserving either the lower bound or the upper bound of uh, the uh, durations. So as you can see, the result is quite horrible. Out of like uh, 240,000 test cases, only about 700 of them still remain consistent after we random sample the outcomes from uncontrollable durations. Compared to this, the strong controllability and dynamic controllability approach both gave us 100% guarantee. So regardless what the outcome is from the uncontrolled durations, the network is still consistent. And next, some runtime performance. As you may expect, the consensus-based relaxation approach is the fastest because checking strong controllability, checking dynamic controllability both takes longer time. And also, uh, if we take these two approaches, we may end up with more conflicts. So let me show you uh, the graph. So it's the same set of test cases. Uh, the chart on the top demonstrates how many conflicts we detected within uh, the test cases in order to find a resolution. And the second, uh, the graph on the bottom, demonstrates the quality of, uh, resol uh, the, quality of the solution. It's really interesting because it really matches our intuition. So we know that strong controllability imposes the strongest restriction on the network. Therefore, if we want to restore strong controllability, we have to deal with the most number of conflicts. And if we are dealing with more conflicts, the uh, quality of the solution will decrease because we have to satisfy more constraints while generating the resolutions. So combining the um, robustness of the solution, the quality of the uh, robustness of the outcome, the quality of the solution, as well as runtime performance, I feel that uh, dynamic controllability-based resolution is probably the most preferred approach. And also, remember this, this is based on the O6 paper uh, for dynamic controllability checking, which has a complexity of ON4. But now, like a month ago, the uh, limit, or the upper limit has been pushed to ON3. So we'll definitely work on that and makes it more efficient. So finally, just a quick summary. So within, uh, so throughout this project, we would like to provide a technique that basically extends the original consistent-based relaxation framework to deal with uncontrollable problem to make it ro more robust. But all the features like best first enumeration of re uh, continuous relaxation still apply. So we can still have this type of interactive procedure with the user to resolve any conflicts in his or her tribal plans. So finally, we would like to thank our sponsor and collaborator to support our project. And if you are interested, all the test cases and our implementation are available uh, on my website. And one last slide is, so since this is a project that really geared towards um, working with human, so we built this small transit advisor. It only works for uh, that wraps around our uh, con uh, controllability-based relaxation algorithm. Right now, it only works in Boston, so if you are interested in visiting Boston after the conference, you are feel free to give it a try. It basically optimizes your uh, transit based on your preferences over different mode, 
you have different like departure time, arrival time. You can either take a bike, take a car, take the um, subway, or either rent a bike. And the good thing is each time you use this app, I will get a dozen test cases. So that's the end of my presentation. Thanks. Okay, uh, I think we have time for a question or two, if there are any. Jeremy. So especially in the case of the uncontrollables, um, relaxing those might actually be quite tricky, right? So I'm telling you that you know my uncertainty on this is, is given some bound, and now you're coming back with some solution to your overconstrained problem and saying, well, you can pretend it's a little less than that, can't you? So, uh, so what happens if they come back and and you know you just you just say, well, I'm sorry, I, I really can't admit this relaxation. So, what do you do now? So that's why I feel that this uh, interactive process is important because I start with a predefined user preference because I don't know everything about the world. So if I generate a typing thing that okay, can you? pretend that you have to take 50% of work and you tell me no, then it, it becomes a new conflict for my algorithm. So I know, okay, I can push it, but I can never push it like towards 50%. I have to try something different. Then basically I would just go ahead to see if I can relax some other constraints while respecting the new constraint you just gave me. So it's kind of through this interaction, you're trying to learn more constraints that is not available in the beginning. Yeah, let me, let, let me just add one, one comment to that is, your concern is you don't know how much risk that you're incurring on that, right? And so really what we're driving towards is, would you be willing to accept this much more risk of not achieving your objective? And the paper that Simon and Pong are giving at AAAI talks about how do you link risk to the uncertain durations. So I was a bit confused about the table you showed about the simulations and the percentage because yeah. I thought you were squeezing things to make it dynamically controllable. So can't the simulation not pay attention to your squeezing and then therefore you wouldn't have actually a consistent executed schedule? Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's a good question because while I'm really doing the simulation, if I do the squeezing, I assume that, okay, I will only consider like the random outcomes between the squeeze duration. Yeah, it's not because here I was mainly want to show that how unreliable the consistent base approach is because it completely ignores the uncertain like nature of uncertain durations. But yes, what the next immediate next thing we are going to do is actually really we need to quantify like how much risk we are taking by doing the squeezing at each of these uncontrollable durations because usually because here we are taking a controllable approach basically we are assuming that there is a like uniform distribution before lower bound, upper bound, we squeeze it and we're basically taking a percentage of risk here. But yes, you, but, most of the time it's not. But, but just to comment on your, your experimental method, I mean, one column is doing a simulation with the wide domains, one column is doing a simulation with the domains that are perfect for you. So I think that's not a really a fair comparison between what's going on there, yeah. even though they all are your techniques. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Okay, I think we better give the speaker a hand again. Yeah.